As we travelled, we came near a very great hill called Pendle Hill, and I was moved of the Lord to go up to the top of it, which I did with difficulty. It was so very steep and high. 362 years have passed since George Fox's famous ascent, but a steep hill is still a source of difficulty and opportunity for friends, which is by way of getting around to the subject of Friends Meeting of Washington and our proposed renovation. The first thing to mention is that we are built on a hill, on the side of a hill. How did we get up here, and what should we do about it? Let's start with a little history. As soon as Washington was founded, Quakers began to meet here. Pierre L'Enfant drew up the city plan in 1791. You'll notice that he stopped drawing when he got to the foot of the bluff in the northwest. No one would try to build up there for more than a century. Congress arrived in 1800. Ten years later, the population had grown to 9,000, and friends built a brick meeting house at the imaginary corner of future 18th and I Streets Northwest, four blocks from the White House. By mid-century, Washington had grown to about 40,000 residents. Pennsylvania Avenue was still paved with mud, and Constitution Avenue was paved with water. The Smithsonian Castle still had that new castle smell. In 1858, Washingtonians were still using L'Enfant's map, and real buildings had filled it in a little. The Potomac was still very wide. The new mall stopped at the Washington Monument, which still needed a little work. Constitution Avenue was still wet. The I Street meeting was one of these buildings. The meeting followed the Hicksites in the Schism of 1827. Orthodox Friends did not have an organized meeting in Washington until after the Civil War. A few blocks from the White House, Connecticut Avenue was now real enough that somebody had built a little bridge over the creek. DuPont Circle was still imaginary. Back then, if you said you had a house on P Street, you really did have a house on P Street. Florida Avenue was still just the edge of town. Our future meeting site belonged to Professor Charles Jewett, librarian of the Smithsonian Institution. In 1869, Washingtonians were still using L'Enfant's map, and the real city, that's the shaded areas, now reached as far as DuPont Circle. Even in 1892, the White House was still beachfront property, and the railroad station was right in the middle of the mall. But at the end of the century, Rand McNally's map showed that Florida Avenue was a real street and our neighborhood had begun to fill in, though there were still gaps in Decatur Place and S Streets where our meeting house would someday stand. In 1903, the new Washington Heights development was mostly vacant. One big empty lot took up most of our block. Three years later, noted architect Ogden Codman filled in one corner with the Codman Davis House, which is now the residence of the Thai ambassador. That same year, Orthodox friends who had been meeting in various places found a vacant lot at 13th and Irving Streets Northwest and built themselves a meeting house, a building which still stands there today. By 1919, our hillside was mostly settled but our block was still mostly empty. In 1923, Oliver Rickinson, an archaeologist with the Carnegie Institution, bought part of the block and built a large house. In 1930, he bought the lot next door and added a two-car garage. Meanwhile, the I Street Friends Meeting and the Irving Street Meeting had been talking about trying to heal our century-old schism by creating a new cooperative meeting. Although neither meeting could find unity to support this idea, they both released their members to proceed independently. After that, things moved rapidly. Time was saved by using the same architect, the same stone quarry, and much the same plans as the Westtown School Meeting House, 
built the previous year. Possible sites were surveyed by First Lady Lou Henry Hoover and Mary Vox Walcott, who raised $45,000 to purchase the Florida Avenue property. Lucy M. Wilbur Foster of Rhode Island donated $75,000 to build the meeting house. The decision to move forward was made in May. The new meeting was incorporated in June. Construction bids were solicited. Ground was broken in July, and the first meeting for worship in our new meeting house was held on January 4, 1931. In the early days, the meeting room was filled to capacity. The I Street Meeting House was sold seven years later, but the Irving Street Meeting continued on, selling its building in 1947, and finally merging with the College Park Meeting to form the Adelphi Meeting in 1956. Twenty years after the meeting was built, our neighborhood had filled in, and the first wave of baby boomers was rolling into our first day school. By 1961, we would have 14 classes, 30 teachers, and 232 children. The meeting's first response in 1950 was to expand the meeting house, adding Decatur Place room, terrace room, and the library. Here's what the meeting looked like without those rooms. And here's what it looks like today. In 1970, we added more space by joining our property to the property next door with its big old house and its two-car garage. We decided not to call it the two-car garage, so now it's Carriage House. With this purchase of Quaker House, we had the FMW campus you see today. Quaker House was purchased partly for classroom space and partly as a social services center, initially called Friends Center. Today, five nonprofit organizations have offices there. So, what were we talking about? Oh, yeah, the renovation and our hillside location. Being on a hillside can cause problems accessibility issues, circulation and traffic issues and various water issues. Accessibility, which is really the main point of the project. When it was built in 1930, the meeting house had no wheelchair accessibility. When we added the 1950 edition, the new terrace room was accessible, at least from the terrace. Then, in 1956, we took a big step forward by ramping up to the north door of the meeting room. That ramp, renovated in 1996, makes the meeting house upper level somewhat accessible. The ground floor of all the buildings and the back garden were all inaccessible until last year, when we added a small ramp to the west door of Quaker House, making the west ground floor offices accessible. Beyond that, we've been talking about accessibility for many years. Our discernment has involved many architects, many reports and studies, many committees, many friends, many years, and many, many plans. In 2008, the property committee suggested that we narrow the focus of our renovation discussions and just move forward to build a new welcoming entrance and an elevator in the space between our two buildings. The meeting said, yes, do that. That turned out to be a little more complicated than it sounds. It's not enough just to get from the ground level to the upper level. You have to be able to get into the building in the first place. Then, once you get off the elevator, you have to be able to get around. That's a problem, because our buildings are built on many levels and are not connected together, and they have poor internal connections. Here's a question for you. How many sets of stairs does our meeting have? You may not notice it, but many of our doors have a single step up, enough to block a wheelchair.
Here's one we fixed. Here's another ramp, but this one is too steep for a wheelchair. But we won't count those as stairs. We'll start counting with the places that have two steps. Or three. Or four. Or five. Or six. Or too many. That's a total of 30 sets of stairs. You may have noticed that many of those stairs are outdoors, and that's a problem because we often have events that use our wonderful garden space, but it's almost entirely inaccessible. From the near corner of the back garden to the far corner is a 14-foot climb, the equivalent of 25 steps. And our back garden isn't really connected to the meeting house. When the meeting house was built, we didn't have a back garden. This concrete trench was our backyard. And we never made the connection. We still just climb a couple of stairs from the assembly room to the trench, and then a couple more steps to get to the yard next door. The carriage house door is in another trench. The many levels continue inside the buildings. Quaker House and Carriage House are especially difficult. Here are the upper and lower levels of those buildings. The different colors you see here represent different levels, which prevent wheelchairs from moving from one area to another. But Quaker House has another problem. It was built as a private house with a two-car garage. It was never designed to be a public space, and so it has almost no internal connections. To get from this room to that room, you often have to go through somebody's office or a room where a meeting may be taking place, or just out one door, up the street, and in another door. This is hard on our tenants, but impossible for anyone in a wheelchair. This plan shows the ground floor hallways of our buildings, highlighting the lack of connections. Even for those who can climb stairs, accessibility is a huge problem. Many meeting friends have never seen many of the rooms in our buildings. If you want to tour the building now, you'll need good shoes, a guide, and a full set of keys. In 2012, the meeting decided to go forward with a project to address these problems by building an elevator lobby, connecting our indoor spaces together, and providing a level and accessible back garden and related improvements at a cost of nearly $2 million. We signed a design contract with an architecture and engineering firm, and design and fundraising work is now moving forward. Here's our plan. We'll build a nice stone tower with an elevator in it. We'll build an elevator lobby with a new, welcoming and accessible front entrance that will be the main entrance for all our buildings. We'll connect that lobby to the meeting house hallways on both levels. The meeting office will have a door into the lobby for welcoming and security. And we'll build new corridors along the whole length of Carriage House and Quaker House, connecting all the spaces together, with ramps in the corridors to accommodate the different levels. Once you are in the new connecting lobby, there are 19 different doors or hallways that you can use to exit from this space. That's a lot of connecting. Finally, we'll dig the back garden down four or five feet to create a level terrace and patios, wheelchair accessible from the lobby, or from carriage house, or from the assembly room. A small ramp and landing will make the existing front door and the Decatur Place room wheelchair accessible. Three doors will fully connect the assembly room space to the new assembly room terrace. Our meeting room can host meetings, weddings, and other events for over 350 people, but our assembly room can handle less than a third of that for wedding dinners and similar events. The new assembly room terrace space 
and accommodate an event tent that can more than double that available space. The Quaker House living room will have its own accessible terrace, and a large new storage room will be constructed under that terrace, so we will no longer have to store tables and chairs in our first-day school spaces. Here's a plan that shows the upper level of our buildings and grounds. On this level, the hallways are even more disconnected. The new lobby and corridors will make this whole level into one accessible space. The Quaker House garden, which is now a valley, will be filled in, creating another level and accessible terrace space. A new stairway will lead down from the Quaker House terrace to the lower level. There is also room for an accessible pathway along the north wall connecting the meeting room north door and the east garden space. This reconfiguration of the back garden will eliminate 10 existing sets of stairs and make almost the entire garden wheelchair accessible. Our architects have provided us with a model of the new addition to help us visualize it. Architects used to build models by hand out of cardboard, balsa wood, glue, and other stuff from the craft store but now they work with virtual models built in computer space out of electronic parts, and that's what we're going to look at now. We can turn the model this way and that and look at it from all sides. We can even walk in through the imaginary front door and look around inside. Remember, this is just a rough model, so don't take the details too seriously. The meeting house isn't really made out of purple bricks, and we're not planning to replace Decatur Place with AstroTurf. This is the new front entrance in the space between our buildings. Just for comparison, here's what that space looks like now. In front of the new elevator tower on the left is an accessible ramp and space for plants or a tree. Straight ahead is the new entrance lobby with the garden in the background. The door on the right opens into the meeting office for welcoming and security. The second door is a hallway that leads to the assembly room and other ground floor meeting house spaces. The glass doors open out onto the new assembly room terrace, with the assembly room doors and the kitchen door on the right. The bluestone floor of the lobby matches the bluestone terrace outside. That gives a sort of feeling that the garden and the lobby are all one connected space. These stairs and the elevator on the left will take you up to the meeting room, the parlor, the Quaker House living room, the Quaker House terrace, and other upper level spaces. Down this hallway are all the ground floor carriage house and Quaker House spaces. The first door on the left opens into the carriage house with matching doors on the right leading out onto the patio. The second door leads to an accessible bathroom, while the hallway on the left leads to the Quaker House main stairs and street door in the central office spaces. These doors on the right open into the large new storage room under the new Quaker House patio, while the hallway on the left will take you to the ground floor offices on the west end of Quaker House. Backtracking we'll return to the carriage house door leading out onto the terrace. Next to the kitchen door on the right is a gate leading to a trash storage alcove. The retaining wall in the back will actually be a foot or two shorter than you see it here, and you'll see a lot more greenery and a lot less wall. The trees above the wall will be the existing hollies and the oak tree on the left. The stairway on the left leads up onto the new Quaker House patio. The doorway, which will be a little less spartan than you see it here, opens into the new storage space for access to gardening and play equipment. If 
Here's the back view of the new lobby. Three new doors lead into the assembly room. We'll duck inside for a moment to see the view of the terrace from the assembly room doors. Back out on the terrace, we can return to the lobby. Going up the stairs to the meeting room level, you will see a panoramic view of the garden spaces. This hallway will have a double door into the parlor on the right, the meeting room on the left, and the east garden straight ahead. The interior window belongs to the parlor. In order to connect the new entrance lobby to the meeting room, we will have to create a hallway at the north end of the parlor. The sliding pocket doors that now separate the parlor from the library will be moved to connect the parlor to the new hall. The remaining parlor space will be combined with the library to provide a new and larger parlor. The view of the hall through the parlor door will look something like this. Turning right from the stairs, you'll see a lovely view of the new Potomac Bay, if we don't build this before global warming sets in. Down this corridor, you see the top of the elevator on the left, and beyond that, the carriage house roof and dormers. The middle dormer will be a door into the carriage house office spaces. Doors connect the carriage house terrace on the left to the new Quaker House terrace on the right. As we arrive at Quaker House, the corridor opens out into a taller and wider gathering space. The French doors on the left open into the top of the main Quaker House stairs. The second set of French doors opens into the Quaker House living room. Directly opposite those doors on the right are glass doors leading out into the new Quaker House terrace. The door at the end of this space opens into the Quaker House west offices, kitchenette, and bathroom. The trees you see here represent the existing trees on the north side of this space. This terrace will be mostly level, but rises a few feet as it approaches the northwest corner. There is room for an accessible path along the back leading to the meeting room north door in the east garden. From above, you can see that one of the meeting house dormers on the left will be converted into a door, providing maintenance access to the new green roof. This green roof, along with the regraded and leveled back garden spaces, will allow us to meet the district's new stormwater management rules. That will reduce our contribution to the runoff that causes the combined sewer system overflow into the Potomac River during major storm events. The regrading and other measures should also eliminate the water infiltration that now bubbles up along the west wall of the meeting house kitchen during extended rains. Trench drains and a new 15-inch drainage line will handle the remaining runoff from the back garden and from the Costa Rican Embassy. Here, again, you can see how the second set of patio doors connects the existing carriage house terrace with the new terrace and stairs. Our walkthrough ends with a trip down the new stairs to the lower terrace.
What about the environmental impact of the renovation? In addition to the stormwater management improvements, the renovation will bring another important change. We will be using efficient zoned heat pumps throughout Quaker House and Carriage House and in the new addition. These will replace the old boiler and 30 radiators that have required us to heat and sometimes overheat the entire building space 24-7, whether it was occupied or not. A few years ago, we burned more than $8,000 worth of gas in just one winter to heat mostly empty spaces in Quaker House and Carriage House. With the new system, 18 local thermostats will let us heat and cool occupied spaces as needed. In addition to that, the new corridor and lobby will cut heat loss through the uninsulated walls of Quaker House and Carriage House, reducing energy use in those spaces. We see an important environmental gain in the way in which the changes will make it possible for our buildings and grounds to be used by more people more often. We hope that the renovation will help us continue in the direction of making our spaces available for use by nonprofit organizations and other members of our community. That outreach will help generate the revenue we need to renovate and properly maintain these spaces. We hope that you join us in looking forward to these changes, and we also hope that you will consider a contribution to the capital campaign to make this all possible.